Good morning. If you have your Bibles and you will, turn to the book of Amos chapter 4. Amos, one of the smallest books in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 4. It's right after Joel. Amos chapter 4. We're going to continue the sermon series today. Proverbs chapter 9 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Today we are moving on uh, past His Word and we're now walking into the fear for His high places. Say high places. places. Fear for His high places. Amos chapter 4, beginning in verse number 11. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus will I do unto you, O Israel, and because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet your God. Wow, that doesn't sound very comfortable. Does it to you? Well, to two of you, it doesn't sound very comfortable. I don't know if you understand this, but today is Deliverance Sunday, and some of you need to be delivered. Some of you need to be delivered from yourself. Some of you need to be delivered from your sin. Some of you, there is a holy and a living God who demands and declares and decrees because He is holy. We must be holy. Verse 13, for lo, he that forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares unto man what what is his thought that makes the morning darkness and treads upon the high places of the earth. Treads upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Turn around to somebody before you're seated and say, we must honor his high places. may be seated in the presence of the Lord after you have done so. I understand sometimes why things happen. Uh, There are times that we can come in this place and everything is is running smooth and there there are other times uh, that everything in the house is discombobulated. It looks like nobody prayed. It looks like there's nobody here. It looks like and everything is just discombobulated and I have to tell you it ticks me off every time everything looks discombobulated but the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart one time and he said things in the church are discombobulated when my people's lives are discombobulated when they have forgotten me and they're trying to do everything by themselves everything in their life and everything they touch will seem to be discombobulated when we, are more cons- when we are more excited to get in the shower in the morning than we are to come to God's house in the morning, there is an issue. And now I have to tell you that through all uh, of Scripture we see written about high places. Normally, when you read about high places in the Scripture, though, it is talking about what you ought to tear down, what you, not, what you ought not to do. Every time you see, in fact, the book of Deuteronomy talks a lot about high places and how God was so mad and angry because the children of Israel worshipped at the high places uh, that he just absolutely wanted to pull his hair out because the children of Israel kept going to the high places to worship. So pastor, what are you talking about? Hey, let's do this. Everybody stand up. Everybody sit down. Everybody stand up. Everybody sit down. Everybody wave at me. All right, you ought to be awake. So here we go. 
Everywhere in Scripture, everywhere in Scripture that you see and talk about high places, uh, more times than not, it is something that God is telling people to, to tear down, not to build up. And here you say, Pastor, that we ought to reverence the high places of God. What do you mean by that? Do you understand that brick and mortar of this place can fall in on itself, uh, but what will determine whether or not you're the church is whether you can go out in an empty field and worship the Lord. You are the high places that you ought to honor today for God does not reside in houses made of wood and stone but the Bible says that you are the habitation of the Lord. That you your heart is where he lives and yet may I tell you uh, that more times than not we see it in the church uh, how you look in the mirror and you begin to tear down what God is called righteous, what God is called holy you tear down you tear down you will dishonor your own body you will dishonor God by doing so and yet you come in the house of God and you will raise your hand and you'll say hallelujah and your focus is on God yes but you fail to understand that God has established within you his high place Yet we have exalted boats and cars and houses and church buildings. And we have said, well, this is the high place of God. And by the way, I think... Uh, that there are going to be some of you in this place today and those of you who are watching that you're about to be delivered and you're about to be delivered from yourself because you don't know who you are in the kingdom of God. Thus, because you don't know who you are, you treat yourself in a way that God does not even treat you. You get in the mirror and you point your ugly, nasty finger in your own face and you say you're nobody and you're nothing and yet God says you are the righteousness of God in Christ and no wonder you can't act like the righteousness of God because you don't believe you are some of you will be doing summer, somersaults jumping jacks and cartwheels I hope when this is over because you're about to walk into the realization that God has his hand upon your life and that he, he loves you no wonder you can't live according to his word because you think that you're nobody and that you're nothing. Do you realize that the word of God is of no effect if you come to church and you hear it? The word of God is only effectual in your life if you come into agreement with it. Well, I heard what pastor said today, but I don't agree with that. You leave, well, everybody else got a blessing and I'm leaving. And oh, it was a good word, but my goodness... I, I'm not going to come into an agreement with that. I know the pastor said that I'm the head and not the tail and then you go home and look in the mirror and tell yourself how horrible and how rotten you are and that God must have forgotten all about you. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. God has established the heart of man. Although the heart of man has, has been evil continuously, I, I think it interesting that it is the heart that that God wishes to come and reside in and it is the heart that God wishes to change. It is the heart that God focuses upon. Not your outward appearance, not what you do on the outside, but it is the thoughts and the intents of the heart with which God will, will recognize who you are. Uh, you may have stumbled and fallen yesterday uh, but God wants to know, is it a condition of your heart or was it an uh oh? Was it a momentary relapse or is it a condition of your heart? And yet, we 
have been conditioned to deal with the outward appearance that some places that I if I were to go preach there today, they would laugh me to scorn for what I am wearing. And if I wore shorts, there are places who would laugh me to scorn for what I'm wearing. And if I wore a suit, they would laugh me to scorn for what I'm wearing. And or if I wore jeans, they would laugh. You can't win and be a pastor. You always got to take a poll when you go to another church to preach. What is your dress code at your church? Well, we wear suits. Well, we wear jeans. Well, we wear robes. And I never say this, but maybe one of these days I'll get the intestinal fortitude to say it. I want to start asking people, why is that your dress code? Why did you put on what you put on today? To come to this church. Why did you wear slacks if you wore slacks? Why did you wear jeans if you wore jeans? Why did you wear shorts if you wore shorts? Why did you wear your pajamas if you wore your pajamas? Why in the world did you wear what you wore when you came to church today? We all know the answer to why you wore what you wore. And the answer is because you felt like wearing it. But why is it that there is a dress code when you come to church? We have taught people. That it is not about the condition of your heart that matters. What matters is what you wear. We have taught people, it's not about the heart with which you sing, but it's about the music that you sing. Listen, I was probably 14, 15 years old when a little group by the name of the Imperials came out with songs like Cast Your Bread Upon the Water. Noah Build an ark, build an ark, build an ark, sail out on the open water, save your sons and your daughters, build an ark. And do you know the people in my church thought that that was so contemporary that it had to be of the devil? And now compared to our music, that is mild. And yet, oh my God, I'm about to step on somebody today. And yet they'll get in church and say, I heard an old, old story. And don't, don't realize that that was a bar song before it became a hymn. <laughs> Hebrews 10 and Verse 25 says, Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the custom of some and so much more as you see the day approaching. I always love how God will always confirm what His message is for the church uh, by how many people comment on my stuff on Facebook. And I did a video the other day and I talked about uh, verse... 10, or chapter 10 of Hebrews and verse number 25. Well, you don't have to go to church in order to go to heaven. Do you know what they're really saying when they say that? Because we understand and comprehend that this church is, or this building is nothing but brick and mortar. But what they're really saying is, you're not important. You're not important enough to show up and be with the people of God because you are the church. It didn't say, go to that one place where you meet every week but it says do not forsake the assembling of the church together. So then if the brick and the mortar were to fall down around us, so what would determine whether or not we are the church is whether or not you, you show up where we're meeting on next Sunday. And 
I'm about to step on some toes and I don't care. You pretending to be the church and don't come to church, it's because you aren't the church and you need to get saved. For although church will not save you, when you are saved, you'll go to church. The question has been asked this week, well, my church has a lot going on. When am I considered faithful? I miss one Wednesday night in two months. Am I faithful? I don't know what is the condition of your heart. Am I faithful? I don't know. Did you call the pastor and tell him you're sick so you could go to a party? Then you're not faithful. Did you tell the pastor you were sick so you could have a Bible study? You're not faithful. Did you tell the pastor that you couldn't make it because you had PTSD and then went to a concert on Wednesday night? You're not faithful. When you ought to just be honest and say, you know what? I don't go to church because I don't like all the church. I don't go to church because that Pastor Nate dude is a jack wagon. I don't go to that church down there because I don't like that Pastor's wearing a robe. Or I don't like that he's wearing shorts. Or I don't. But yet, when you consider the outward appearance of a man, you fail to take into consideration what is the heart of the matter. And may I tell you, you have been conditioned to focus on your outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones because you have all of the all of the say sos on the outside, but you don't have anything on the inside. Let's just dispel a myth right here and right now. I don't go to church, Pastor, because of all of the hypocrites in the church. I can go down to the motorcycle rally. I can go down to the bar. I can go and there's some better people there than is in the church. I am here today to tell you you're a lion sack because what separates me from those down at the bike show and those in the bar is I have been sanctified and redeemed and bought by the blood. I'm better than they are. Oh my goodness, I can't believe he just said he was better than anybody. I, I know, that's your problem. You don't think you've been above your junk. And the damage in the church, one of the, one of the things that has damaged the church is that we have not thought we are better and so we have not acted better. Thus, we can't get people to come to church because of all the hypocrites in the church. Well, I'll go to church when there's not so many hypocrites in the church. Then you shall never go to church. Just one time, one time I'm dying to hear somebody say, I refuse to go to the bar because of all the hypocrites in the bar. Hi! I want somebody to, to if, you, if you're going to judge a one thing, judge it all. There's, a, there's as many hypocrites at the bar as there is in the church. But yet you'll still go to the bar, but you won't go to the house of God. I used to go to the bar. They talk about everybody just like they do in the church. Uh, Yet you'll still go to the bar, but you won't go to the church. They cheating on their wife at the bar. And yet you'll still go to to the bar and not the house of God. You're the biggest hypocrite of us all. Is that all right? Uh, I don't care if it was, I still go in there. Uh, Just one time, I want to hear people talk 
and say, I refuse to go to the bar because of all the hypocrites they got going on in the bar. I'm waiting for one time for somebody to say, I'm not going to go see Luke Bryan because of all the hypocrites at the Luke Bryan concert. I won't go see Boston. I won't go see Aerosmith. I won't go see Ozzy Osbourne. I won't go see them because of all the hypocrites that are going to be at that concert. I'm, 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 I'm waiting on somebody to get real and stop using as an excuse that there's a bunch of hypocrites in the church. You're the biggest one there is. Well, when everybody gets right in the church... And yet you don't say when everybody gets right at the bar. When everybody gets right at Johnny's baseball game, then I'll come to church. When everybody gets right at Johnny's baseball game and Sally's soccer game, then I'll go to the baseball game and I'll go to the soccer game. You have diluted what God really wants to do in you and you have cheapened his high places you you hath he quickened who were dead and trespasses and sin what separates me from the dude at the bar is not because I never make a mistake, but what separates me from the man at the bar is that I have been sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And now although I still have the ability to sin, I don't have the ability to enjoy it very long uh, for the individual that we talked about last Sunday. The blessed Holy Spirit now comes and says, Stop it! Stop it! You're better than that. Hey! Stop it! You're better than that problem within the church is we have been conditioned and we have been taught uh, that uh, you come to Jesus and don't worry about it. We're just all frail like everybody else. Don't worry about it. You're going to sin. Don't worry about it. Everything's okay when you do. Don't worry about it. God understands. If God understood, he would not have called his people to holiness. But holiness is not what you do on the outside, but it is what is happening on the inside of your heart. Uh, that as you keep the letter of the law, but your heart is far from him, you honor him with your lips, but your heart is cold and black and dirty and nasty. You'll judge everybody in the church for not having their walk right when your walk is just as dirty. In fact, it's probably even worse because you'll never take care of your nonsense as long as you're looking at everybody else's. This, this is one of the least judgmental churches that I've ever been to in my life. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. In the original Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, it is written uh, like this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk in the flesh but follow after the spirit. My question to you today is, are you following after the flesh or are you in the flesh following after the spirit? You cannot follow the flesh and the spirit at the same time. For you will either love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve two masters. And some of you, it's time uh, that you square your shoulders back. You plant your feet and you say, oh, whether God be God, I do not care. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord regardless of what you do.
Now, I fully understand and recognize that we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. I get it, I understand it, and I don't have a problem with that. And yet, the Word says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there are those of us among the household of faith that will say that the law is archaic, that we do not need to be holy any longer because now we're not under the law, but we are under grace. You have no bearing of where you are spiritually because I am here today to tell you that obedience is still better than sacrifice and although you might ride to church with your windows down when it's 20 degrees baby I'm here today to tell you that your obedience to God is better than your sacrifice for Him and He's more concerned about what He wants to do in you than what He wants to do through you My people are lost because of distractions. The bar, the concert, the baseball game, the motorcycle rally will not deliver your family. If you have built some rapport with the owner of the bar, and you go in the hospital, that sucker bill may come see you. (laughs) But you cannot get out the yellow pages. Close your eyes and put your finger on a bar. Call it up and say, I'm in the hospital and I want somebody to come see me. They will laugh at you because they're not in the business of you. They're in the business of alcohol. They are not in the business Of helping you. But today if you go into the hospital. You could close your eyes. And you could make a circle. And you could put your finger on any church in this city. And almost every single one of them. You could call and say I'm in the hospital. And I'm needing somebody to come pray with me. And I promise you. That somebody is going to get out of their comfort zone. And they're going to drive to the hospital. And they're going to come lay hands on you. Even though they don't know who you are. And they are going to take time away from their family. And they're going to pray for you. And yet you'll still sit in judgment of God high places his church let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together well you God understands I had I had a, a weekend with my friends you, you don't understand yeah I know you had a weekend with your friends the problem is not a weekend with your friends the problem is Four years of weekends with your friends. The problem is not saying, Pastor, I need a break. Let me talk to the leadership of this church. Because I want you to understand something, leaders. It's not about that we're going to work you like a workhorse. and You don't get any time to yourself and to do things that you want to do. The problem is when we come among the church on a Sunday morning and somebody says, where's that leader? And I say, and by the way, it happens every time you don't show up to church. And I say, I don't know. I didn't get a phone call from them at all. If you don't show up for work, you'll call your employer and 
say, I'm not going to be there. You know why? Because you honor your paycheck. Because you know, if you don't show up, we call it no call, no show. That's what your employer calls it. That's what we call it here. You done? You finished? Because if, you, if you're not, I'll give you the microphone and you can say whatever it is you want to say. No call, no show. No call, no show. And yet you tout yourself to be a leader of the Link Church. And you're a no call, no show. And wonder why nobody will follow you. They, people are smart and they understand whether or not you really care for them or not. If you don't bother, if you're a leader and you don't even say to those who are following you, hey, I just want to let you know in case you need something, you need to go to pastor or you need to go to the women's ministry director or you need to go to this person or that person, go see Pastor Nate because I'm going to be on vacation and I'm not going to be there for a week. These people are of the household of faith. And these people are the house of God. These people have the anointing resting upon them and the Holy Spirit living upon the inside of them. And yet, you don't even let them know when you're going to be gone. And yet, if you show up next Sunday morning and I'm not here, everybody's going to start asking, where's pastor? And as they take a survey and nobody knows where pastor is. They're going to start thinking, well, who's going to preach today? And they ask Stephanie, where's Pastor Greg at? She says, I don't know. I hope he's all right. And Sunday afternoon. I come rolling in, Pastor, where, where are you? Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm good. I just thought I'd go to the lake. Yeah, I just thought I'd go hear Todd White. Yeah. We got a half inch of snow and I couldn't get out of my driveway. You laugh. That happens here in the wintertime. Got a half inch of snow, can't get out of my driveway. But I went to Walmart and I went to the gas station and I went everywhere else. We get a dusting of snow and people are calling going, we having church today? What? And now I'm bringing this around full circle. The church is not this building. The church is you. And if every brick and if every piece of mortar fell around our feet, question is are you the church or did you just come to watch a show I can't partner because I have to volunteer you're right 
Because the question is, do you love these people? That person that's sitting beside you, do you love them? Or do you just tolerate them? Do you love them enough to come spend time with them? Or do you just call them when you get yourself in a world of hurts? There was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus one day and he said, Good master, what do I have to do to go to heaven? And Jesus said, Keep the commandments. The rich man said, Woo, I got that accomplished. I am all right. Everything is good. I don't have a care in the world. Jesus, picking up on all of this, says to him, Whoa, 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 wait. You want to go to heaven? Sell everything that you have. Give your money to the poor. And come follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away sorrowfully. Come be a part of us. If you want to go to heaven. And the man went away sorrowfully. Because he was there for a heavenly message. He was there to tell him how good he was. Because he had the opposite problem of many. He would look in the mirror and tell himself how great he was. And I've got all of this covered because I keep the commandments. Jesus says, sell everything you've got. Give your money to the poor and come follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away sorrowful. He came so that Jesus could pat him on the back and stroke his ego. But when he received the truth from Jesus, he went away sorrowful. I want you to understand today this church loves people. But I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it gets pretty old to me and my staff to see people walk in the door who want something, but they don't want to be around you. Sack me up some groceries, clown. Give me money for, gla for gas, clown. Give me money for my electric bill, clown. Well, come to church. And they can't even show up to church in order to get a free meal. They love the money. But they don't like you. They don't like you. They don't honor you. They don't want to be around you. They want to come to church for the doodads. They want to come to church for the good stuff. Come on Wednesday night. I mean, look, with the, you, can, you can ask Shelby, you can ask Sarah, you can ask Pastor Nate. We have had people walk in this mug and say, I want some food. Offered to go down to the fellowship hall and fix it for them. And they get mad that you're not giving them money. <laughs> they walk in the door, what do, I, what do I have to do in order to get some food around here? Hang on just a moment and we'll fix it for you. Well, I didn't really mean food. I really meant money. What do I got to do to get some money around it? We don't give money around here. Well, you don't help anybody. 
wonder if that's what that rich man was saying. How dare he say I got to sell everything. Give my money to the poor in order to go to heaven. I'll do what I want, when I want. And he can suck eggs. Because that dude doesn't know what he's talking about. And yet here he was, the, not only the man of God, the prophet of God, but he was God incarnate, God in the flesh. In closing today, I want to go back to our text. Verse 11 says, I have overthrown some of you. Not all of you, but I've overthrown some of you. I prayed one time and I asked God, why can't I get away with anything? While everybody else is sinning, I can't get away with nothing. Why is that? God said, because you're better than everybody else and you're my child. And although, and although little Johnny may be able, able to go down the road and disobey me, you're mine and you don't get to. I have overthrown some of you. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and ye were a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. You've gone through nonsense. Your life is ruined and ragged and in shambles. You've lost everything that was dear to you. God is now wooing you and calling you to His side for you to honor that which He has established. He has established you. He has His hand upon you. And yet you continue to look in the mirror saying how dirty you are, how nasty you are, how foul you are, how poison you are, how this you are, how that you are. Baby, I'm here today to tell you that you have been created in the image and the likeness of a living God. And God wants to save you and rearrange you and change you from the inside out. God can't help it if you refuse. Find your worth in the successes of your life instead of finding your worth in what God has said about you. It is no wonder that we, God's people, struggle with the things we struggle with as we consistently and constantly tell ourselves, I'm a failure. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. God doesn't love me. God hates me. Well, I've heard it on CNN. It has to be true. Why would CNN... Oh, I'm going to... Why would CNN lie about Donald Trump? Because CNN figured out a long time ago, if you tell a lie long enough, people will start believing it. And as you look in the mirror and say, you're nobody, you're nothing, if you tell yourself that lie long enough, you will start believing it. And you'll have to set appointments with counselors who will tell you you're not as bad as what you think that you are. And they're going to have to get you out of this vicious cycle that you're in. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms and die. I don't like anybody else. The church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. I'll go down to the bar where they love me. You tell yourself that long enough, you'll start believing that nonsense. And when you start believing it, you'll start saying it over and over and over. For far too long, People have told you that you aren't important. Far too long they've said, I don't have to go to church to go to heaven. My goodness. 
Even a car knows. Even a car knows that if he doesn't get to the filling station before too long, he's going to die on the side of the road. Cars have more sense than people. Okay. People who drive cars have more sense than people in the church. I don't have to go to church to be saved. That's true. You can go home. If you're watching today, you can kneel down by your couch by your bedside you can confess Jesus as Lord believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and on the authority of God's word you will be saved and on your road to heaven but I'm telling you you better get planted and you better get rooted in a good Bible believing church because you cannot make the journey without the church I can't Isn't it, oh God, isn't it funny that people going to hell will always gather around other people who are going to hell? Because they know they can't get to hell without other people going to hell. Because don't you know sin's more fun in a group? People who are going to hell shall always get with other people going to hell so they can get to hell. And yet we get saved. And we do not comprehend that in order to go to heaven, we have got to get with other people that are going to heaven because they'll sharpen us. They'll hold us accountable. There's only one place that I know of to find a bunch of people in one place going to heaven. And that's his church. And we have cheapened it because we've cheapened you. You've cheapened it because you cheapen yourself. See, you thought this message was going to go differently than what it did today. You thought we were going to talk about you ought to have reverence for the altars and you got to have reverence for the building and you got to, no, 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 no. You got to have reverence for you. Almost done. Let me tell you, when I was young, I'm not near as stupid as what I was 30 years ago. Shoot. I'm not as stupid as I was five years ago. I used to, when I was when I was young. Again, I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, but I, I had a temper. I'd get mad, and because I didn't have any self-control, I'd take my fist and I'd ram it. I ran my fist one time through my windshield on my, on my truck because I was mad. I know, right? It's unbelievable. I would run my fist through walls. When I would get angry, I could come up with some of the most pithy teardowns. Because I'm telling you, I didn't like to fight. I didn't want to get in one, so I mastered the art of tearing people down with my tongue. When I was angry a long time ago. I mastered wagging my tongue to the point that people would be so afraid that they wouldn't pick on me anymore. I gained a reputation of being a dude that you didn't want to tick off because you tick him off and it's not going to be pretty. And 
those who liked that me flocked to that me. I would even get people who thought I was tougher than what I was because they were afraid in and of themselves. So the enemy took what God had gifted me with and the gift was intestinal fortitude. And the enemy twisted it and the enemy made something out of it that it was not supposed to be. I destroyed relationships. I ruined the lives of people. I broke their spirits. And I am 40, almost 47 years old and I can admit to you that I didn't do that because I was tough. I did it because I was a coward. My mom and daddy started asking, what's wrong with you? They sent me to counselors. Laid me flat on a couch. Spoke to me like Sigmund Freud. Who was an absolute moron. Thinking that they could help me. All they did was make me more angry. The first Saturday night in June. Second Saturday night in June, excuse me. I walked into a little bitty church. Saved, yes. Filled with the Holy Ghost? Yeah. I began to see some other things in my life that I had struggled with just kind of fall by the wayside. But that anger thing was still prevalent in my life. The second Saturday night in June, 1997, I walked into a little church, met a little freak, and if he was here today, he'd laugh that I called him that, and I thought, my God, what do we have here? He was shorter than me, but the afro on his head made him taller than me. And it was white, looked like the cross between Ronald McDonald and Colonel Sanders. Wore an all white suit with a chain that hung around his neck. And that man of God put his arm around me. Many nights he prayed over me, many nights he loved me, many nights he would call me on the phone and tell me to knock it off. Something happened on the inside of my life, on the inside of my heart. I began to believe that he really did see something 
in me. Met my wife. And if you ever want to change, get around her. Because she don't put up with nonsense. I've, since we've been married, holy smoke, 20 years in February. There were times, first, second, third, fourth, fifth year probably, that I would take tea glasses and she'd tick me off and I'd chunk them across the room. So angry. So mad. And she would laugh at me. When she'd laugh at me, it'd make me more mad than what I was. I was going to I was going to church, but still struggle with things in my life. But when I met this man, and when I met that woman. God began to change me on the inside out. I don't throw tea glasses anymore. I don't run my fists through the wall. One time I threw my keys. My kids about freaked out because they'd never seen that. At my house, we call it pulling a George Airy. Don't make me pull a George Airy. My point is, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't meet that man and that woman at a bar. I didn't go to a motorcycle rally and meet them. I didn't go to a baseball game or a football game. I didn't even go to the lake. I went to church. And the church began to change my life. So you have to forgive me. Sometimes even overlook me. Because I hold such value for his church. Because without his church, I wouldn't be here today. Without his church, I, I wouldn't have met my wife. Without his church, my children would not be here. Without his church, I wouldn't be happy. Without his church, I wouldn't be connected to the Lord. Without his church. So you have to forgive me if I get kind of upset when people denigrate his high place. When they denigrate you. When they would rather spend time at a lake than to be around you. When they would rather go to the bar than be around you. When they use excuses like, I've got PTSD, that's why I can't come to church. And you see pictures on their Facebook of them at a concert with 2,000 people. You have to forgive me. The answer for the world is not found in the bar. And by the way, it's not even found at home in your bed. The answer for the world today is found in the church. And the only way to get truly connected with Him is to reverence that which God has established 
Oh, I know we, the church, have not been everything that we've needed to be. But the church, ladies and gentlemen, is still the best way that I know how to watch as people get saved and healed and delivered. We're going to go out and we're going to do street ministry. Great. You better get them hooked up to the church. Because if you go out here and they say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you're Lord and believe in my heart that God's raised you from the dead. But you don't get them connected. They will not make heaven their home. I need you I don't need you to cut a check I don't need you to give me something but I am stronger with you than without you do you think that I come here on Sunday morning for my health do you think I come here Sunday morning for the paycheck I come here because I love being around the church. That's you. And anyone who doesn't love being around you isn't a part of you. And if they're not a part of you, you might want to be very careful who you allow to pour in to you. Stand to your feet in this place. Father, we love you today.